I am Lilburn Weshi, retired professor of education. I represent my grandchildren. Our concern is school reform, what it is, what it is not, what it costs. School reform is a paradigm shift from schools designed to keep children to schools where every child learns, and that costs money. The paradigm shift required to reform schools is complex. As someone once said, for every complex problem, there is a simple solution, and it's wrong. Learning is a lifelong process, not a customer-driven product. The effective school is learner-driven. Valid school reform is based on three pillars, time to teach, resources, and evaluation. Time to teach requires a class small enough for optimal learning. Research on class size says that best learning occurs in groups of 13 to 17. Overwhelmingly, research tells us the most important element in formal learning is the teacher. Resources begin with a properly equipped classroom. Teacher evaluation concentrates on helping students learn, not just contract extension. There is a place for online courses, but they do not equate with the real classroom. I don't want surgery done on me by the graduate of an online medical school. <laughs> Providing laptops, which many students don't need, and buying clickers is not the wise use of scarce funds. I have yet to see a laptop or a clicker confront, comfort a, ne a neglected, abused child or listen sympathetically to a frightened, pregnant teenager. Real teachers do much more than just dispense knowledge. Redistributing salaries is not reform. Good teachers are already doing their best. Favoring a few will not improve student performance. A few days ago, my Centennial High School grandchildren and their friends talked about their experiences in the Meridian School District. Their classes range in size from 30 to 40 students. They've had nearly 100 different teachers, some they liked, some were okay. Four, they agreed, were bad. Four of 100. During my career, I've observed more than 1,000 teachers in over 40 school districts. One minute, please. With few exceptions, they were capable teachers. Considering the shocking number of dysfunctional families, kids with no home support, and the condition of many classrooms, the teachers of Idaho are doing an amazingly effective job. We need good teachers, and we have thousands of them. This obsession to fire teachers is not the answer. Teachers are not the problem. They should be commended and appreciated, not denied input, insulted with a contract which is degrading, intimidating, guarantees insecurity, and denies academic freedom. Discouraging bright young people from teaching in Idaho, adding three to six students in every classroom, and increasing teacher turnover are giant steps backwards. It's time to reject prejudice and partisan politics. We need to determine the elements for reform, identify costs, and engage in a three to five year long range plan that funds those changes in a series of annual steps, and it will cost money. Most of us want to reform our schools, not dismantle them. Thank you very much. Carol? Good morning, fellow chairman, members of the committee. Thank you for allowing me this opportunity to speak on behalf of the families that I serve. My name is Carol Wallace. I'm a community resource worker and the homeless coordinator for two Lewiston Elementary Schools. Approximately 60% of the students in my schools receive free or reduced lunches, which means they're below the poverty level. To break that down, I serve about 400 poor kids, and not a single one of them has chosen to be poor. The mission of my job is to help families meet their basic needs so their children will not end up in the foster care system. I would love to have the opportunity to tell you the stories of the people I work with, but I can't do that in three minutes. I will tell you that some are homeless, some live without power or water in their houses. Some are mentally and or physically ill. And yes, some are addicts. However, every one of them wants to give their children the best opportunities for success. Taking away vital services such as medical insurance, food, drug courts, or mental health treatment denies them the ability to do so. Please remember when you're facing these difficult budget cuts that these are real people. Clinical research has shown us that the best way for a person to move out of generational poverty is through education. The only way to instill the value of education in a child who is barely surviving, struggling to get to school every day, is a relationship with one important adult. More often than not, that adult is the child's teacher. It is the teacher who is providing extra food, supplies, clothes, rides to activities, a listening ear, and one small amount of consistent love and support to that child. This cannot be replicated through online learning, and it gets more difficult with every additional student in that child's classroom. Lewiston's fourth, fifth, and sixth grades average 25 students each. 
two or more maybe on IEPs for disabilities, two on health plans for health conditions, one or two have severe emotional difficulties, and one may be living in his or her car. Adding two doesn't sound like much, but let me tell you that you put 27 pubescent sixth graders in a very small classroom, and it's certainly not conducive to learning. I am not a classroom teacher, and frankly, I couldn't be one. It is too hard. <sighs> okay, in the elementary schools where I work, many teachers arrive at 7 a.m. and many leave at 7 p.m. On most Sundays, if they're not working a second job, they're at school preparing for the week ahead. They give their money, their hearts, and too often their health to their jobs. I implore the leaders in this state to honor our teachers. Please visit a classroom in your community and see the great things they're doing on a daily basis. Thank you, Thank you very much. Brian? Madam Chair, committee members, I'm Brian Potter, a parent of two sons, a 12-year-old sixth grader with a neuromuscular disease at Potlatch Elementary, and a 17-year-old senior who will be valed valedictorian this year at Potlatch High School. I'm also a veteran English teacher of 26 years in Idaho, a National Board Certified Teacher, and a Fulbright Exchange alumnus. This year, we are hearing that education will be facing a new paradigm, that edu education is going to be student-centered, we are also hearing that Idaho has no money, that research has no definitive results on classroom size, that we can effectively educate our children in larger classes with laptops and clickers, that we cannot even risk one year of ineffective instruction. This year my children have risked a year of slightly less effective instruction because Idaho has no money. Forrest, my oldest, was not able to apply to universities such as Stanford or Dartmouth because they would not accept online foreign language, which is all Potlatch now offers. Forrest was unable to get into a PE class in Potlatch due to cuts in those courses, so he took two online PE courses. <laughs> online PE. And yes, his English class, taught by me, has also suffered because after 26 years of personal research, I have concluded that class size does affect outcome simply because I can't accomplish as much one-on-one -on -one instruction time with 28 students as compared to 18. My youngest son, Bryson, on the other hand, has not had adequate access to the technology he needs, namely a laptop with a touchscreen capability and voice recognition software so that he can compose sentences without a scribe because Idaho has no money. Increased technological crutches and class sizes is not a new paradigm. Okay. Trying to remove the teacher's voice and how students are taught and how the best learning environment affects that learning is not a new paradigm. One minute, please. Effective use of technology, more one-on-one -on -one student teacher contact, safely constructed buildings with gyms, auditoriums, and book-filled libraries in I where isolated communities can proudly gather around their children would be a new paradigm of education for Idaho. Idaho is filled with caring communities that continue to support levies for their schools, but we still struggle with our children. Do lifetime residents who have invested their livelihoods in children forfeit their voice for inequitable treatment of their own children? Is the attrition of 1,100 education-related jobs really helpful to Idaho's economy, to its children? Is it really student-centered to remove effective educators and replace them with clickers and laptops? <laughs> Is this the new paradigm we want for our future? My children cannot risk even one year of ineffective instruction. Thank you. Thank you, and Penny? thank you for your stamina. I really butchered your last name probably. It's all right, it's Sear, but it's Seer. okay. Thank you. <laughs> no you probably problem. take the prize for my, <laughs> my name butchering. That's Go not ahead. a problem. Thank you, Madam Chairman, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Penny Sear. I'm an educator from Moscow, Idaho. Um, I've got a master's in education, nationally board certified, um, and I'm a proud union member as well. Um, I'm very concerned about the proposed education funding that uh, Mr. Luna has brought forward to you and, and his plan for education. 
Um, first of all, I don't believe it's a taxpayer's responsibility to provide personal technology for our students. I think that taxpayers should maintain our schools and the technology in our schools and so that we can continue and grow and learn and, and do more with that technology, but not provide it personally. Um, online classes are important. We have students in Moscow who take them. Um, but it should remain a choice. It should not be imposed on the students and parents. In talking with students in my school, um, students who are taking these classes, I ask them, so do you have a teacher that you can talk to, one student uh, taking a BYU online course? And she said, no. I said, well, who do you ask questions of? My dad. So are we expecting? all parents to now be homeschoolers of their children if we require all children to take online classes. Um, I also hear a lot of students talking about their online classes and why they took them. Because they're easier, they say. They, they can do them in whatever frame of time they want, that kind of thing. And the teachers demand more of them in their classrooms. And of the 46 credits for high school graduation, how many will eventually be required to be taken online? I mean, four or, or eight, 16? Will it be a full year class? One minute, please. Thank you. This requirement will purposefully read or, or direct students away from their community schools and increase the student-teacher ratio with the purpose of eliminating over 1,000 jobs of teachers support specialists and administrators. Um, teachers in Northern Idaho are currently compensated. Some teachers in Northern Idaho are currently receive compensation below Idaho's poverty level. Contrary to Mr. Luna's assertions, class sizes are large. We've got 26 in advanced al algebra, statistics 28, Spanish 332. Diane Ravitch, the author of The Death and Life of Great American School Systems, stated, there is a certain kind of madness in thinking that anyone who has never set foot in a classroom can create a statistical measure to tell us how best to educate our kids. In my written proposal to her testimony to you, I invited each and every one of you to go home to your communities and make an appointment with a teacher and spend an entire day in that teacher's classroom, not in the district Thank office, you. not in the lab. Lounge, okay, thank please. you so and thank much. you very much for your time. Thank you so much, Pete. Good morning, Madam Chairman morning. and members of the committee. My name is Pete Gertensen, and I'm from Lewiston, Idaho, and I'm a retired from the Postal Service. And recently, in 2010, received my Bachelor's of Science degree from Lewis Clark State College. I know the value of a teacher in a classroom setting and the lack thereof for online courses. My daughter, she's a teacher in Moscow and she sends this comment. This year's kids are a handful and this too needs to be taken into consideration. The class size this year and last year are the same but the makeup of the children are different. My son-in-law is a principal at Highland School in Craigmont. He wears many hats. He drives school bus, is an athletic director, coaches, and from time to time teaches. His time is stretched thin and his family pays the price for that. Tom Luna has presented to you a major educational overhaul that he admits did not exist until just a few weeks ago. The first red flag. It was crafted without input from those charged with our children's education, the teachers, superintendents, and administrators. The second red flag. In the last week, we have seen many other red flags raised. Questionable true cost and the overhaul and savings, if any, of this program. Cost to implement the program. Questionable class sizes. Laptop accountability and maintenance. Home internet access. Equitable teacher merit pay 
or bonuses, and the list will grow in the coming days. It surprises me, and it should you, that given these circumstances, how such a plan can be considered viable. The paper doesn't come apart. And if you take seriously your constitutional obligation to provide for a thorough system of public schools, then common sense dictates this ill-conceived plan needs to start over at square one and very soon. Anything short of that is a waste of your time and jeopardizes Idaho's future prosperity. Thank you. Thank you very much.